Welcome to Thelma's Life Story podcast channel. This is part one of a three-part interview with John Robertson about his experiences of live music scene 1960s to the present day. John was born in 1945 in Edinburgh. He began to learn to play an instrument on an old Spanish guitar belonging to his father. He discovered the new craze of rock and roll while on a family holiday in Shetland. They were playing Little Richard on the waltzes. Back in Edinburgh at the age of 17, he joined a band, the Saracens. He later went on to the Moonrakers. We hear stories of the music scene in the 1960s, the venues, the other bands, the Crusaders, the Embers, Free Flight and the Hipple people. And what it was like playing support for the Spencer Davis group, the Bachelors and the Who. Early memories and of emerging rock and pop scene in Edinburgh. Enjoy. Well, my name is John Robertson. I was born in 1945, two days apparently before the last atom bomb was dropped. Quick story. Yeah, carry on. My youngest daughter, when she was at school, they were doing a project on the Second World War. And she was desperate to speak to somebody who knew something about it. And I mentioned I was born two days before the war ended. And she said, I don't suppose you remember anything about it. That, I always like that story. <laughs> two days, two days old. No. I mean, I went to school in 1950, the Royal High School. Stayed there till 1963. I suppose one of the biggest turning points of my, of my life was being on holiday in Shetland around 1956, 57. I'd heard of the term rock and roll but knew nothing about it and I was on a we, we'd gone to a fun fair and we were on something I think you call a carousel and the young lads up there what you might call the teddy boys were playing some music and they played Little Richard's Long Tall Sally and it just exploded my mind and although I didn't know then that that was going to be such a large part of my life that was the start. After that my father was an art teacher he had apparently bought a guitar for still life painting and I got a hold of that guitar and it took me a couple of years to do anything on it. I still have the guitar, I kind of wrecked it, um, but I've still got it hanging on a wall. My mum, I'm the eldest of six, so as I say, I'm the eldest. I've got four sisters and a brother and when I left school, I went to art college. I'd started playing by that time and I joined... Uh, my first gig was, what, 1962. Then I joined a band called The Saracens. Incidentally, whose manager, if you could call it the manager then, was who has just died, Lord O'Neill, Martin O'Neill. Um, he became a lord, 19, well, that was around 1963. And then it, it was like a, a transfer. The Saracens lasted a couple of years. That's when Alistair Velzine, who was the manager of the... Moonrakers, he was at Trinity. The Saracens were a Trinity band apart from myself. Anyway, that was when I joined the Moonrakers because Derek, the bass player, had been assaulted, attacked, and I still think he's suffering from that. Anyway, I joined them, played with them for a while, transferred to Tam Payton Crusaders, who did gigs with uh, the likes of Jim Bakey, Cam Robbie. They were sort of dance band players. I got into that lot. The next move after there was a place called the Free Gardeners Institute at the top of Leith Walk. Did some playing in there, and that was a band called, to, which morphed into Free Flight, who were quite a successful band. Residencies at Livingston Inn and the Kestrel, etc. Um, played with a band called Alex, Alex Shaw, one of Scotland's, if not Scotland's greatest jazzer for a, a summer season. Then I met a, a blind guy called Morris Porteous. Morris, oh, one of the funniest blokes I've ever met in my life. We had a great time. I had a few residencies with him. Morris, I still keep in touch. We played at, there was a miners club at Nidri. Um, then to Pennycook Miners Club. And at the same time, there was a show that my wife, who's a dancer, was in called Pipers in Lothian Road. So that, that was Jimmy Blue, the Scottish accordionist. He played in that band. That was good fun. Then my main band, from 1984 up till maybe 10 years ago, a man called Allegretto. That was a sort of managed and, and keyboardist, Pete Clark, whom I still keep in touch with. Guitarist Raymond, drummer, pro drummer, Mike Travis, great, all good players. That lasted till about 10 years ago. And then since then, with an old friend I'd been at school, Keith Young, Keith bass player, and we do odd 
bowling club or golf club dances and then play in retirement homes and day centres when we get the chance. So in the early days and your first band, where were you playing then? Well, the very first gig I did was in Pilrig Church with... The bass player was called Tom Oswald. His dad was an MP, and he used to run us to the odd gig. Tom Oswald, a Labour MP, funny thing. I mean, at the time, it meant nothing no, no. to me. It was just sc- sort of school gigs, anything you could get. You might have got a pound or two for playing. And you were you were young when you were oh, starting to do this these is gigs. 17, 17 years old. Yeah, um, yeah. I'd barely had a guitar. Well, it took me a couple of years to get off the ground with my with my dad's little Spanish guitar. But eventually, I stuck in and and I learned a few things. And were you taking lessons, or were you just entirely yourself? Never had a lesson in my life. I just read things, listened to people, got interested, heard things that I was interested in, thought, I wonder what that is, and. That was about it. So you mentioned Little Richard. I mean, that, it's quite oh, yeah. a bizarre thing that you go all the way to Shetland to hear rock and roll. Well, I like that. It's it's that's a true story. It's just I remember being on this waltzer, spinning round and hearing this just superb, fast, exciting music. And if it's of any interest, there's no doubt whatsoever he had the best. Ba- it was the band, really. There are, uh, there's a, I'm not sure, is it Rock Around the Clock, the film, where he had four saxophones playing playing on uh, on the film, but in his own band it was two, a tenor and baritone saxophone. And the timing of these guys was super best. They were really a sort of jazz blues band. And as Billy Joel says, the business of music is money. So they just wanted to sell records and he did very well. He's just died as well, yeah, Little yeah, Richard. That's right. but, so Little Richard early influence, who else oh, yeah. in those early days? Well, I suppose you would say, obviously, Elvis. Yeah. And other than that, I can't think of anyone of any... There was no... What do we have here? Tommy Steele, I suppose, Cliff Richard. But and they were OK, sort of British. But Little Richard and, and Elvis were probably the big influences to start with. After that, I heard some unusual what you would call seventh flat and fifth chords and I thought what on earth is that but I was interested so now it's sort of jazz mostly Sinatra the likes of that I think mm. I can't be bothered with too much country and western with the the three the same three chord sequence happening all the time so do you remember your first gig I, well as I say the first one was in in Pilrig Church I remember being extremely nervous Standing in front, I don't know if I had a microphone in those days. I didn't sing much then. I do now. Well, somebody's got to sing. But yes, I can remember being taken there and and shaking with nerves. And I I can't remember what size the crowd. But once that was over, it seemed to get reasonably easy. And we played in places like Magoo's. Right. In fact, now that, now that I think of it, in Magoo's when I was with the Moonrakers, there was there was a. A TV advert was made for Magoo's and it was filmed with the Moonrakers, including myself on stage. I never, ever saw that. It must be out there somewhere, you would th- th- You would think so. We, were, we wore white polo necks and tartan trousers, and this is before the Bay City Rollers. This would be 1964, 65. I never, if, any, if anyone knows of it, I'd love to... It would be nice to see. Well, I shall ask around. That, well. That's fantastic. So Magoo's were actually so good they were having that, uh, or so oh. up there that they were having TV adverts. Well... Local uh, ones, I Yes, think. it was a film. T- they got some big names. I, I, we, we were the support band for The Who, Spencer Davis, Band... Don't think the Kinks. The Kinks were the big favourite band of the Moonrakers, right. but that's two that I can remember, and that must have cost a fair chunk to bring up. I yeah, mean, the Who yeah. in 1964-65, they'd had a couple of hit records. I can remember Keith Moon doing his usual smashing the drums around <laughs> at the end, but that was quite nice to see them yeah. live. And from what I can remember, the I can remember the amount of gear they had on stage and how loud they were compared with us. They had, they had f- four four by twelve cabinets each, the guitarist and bass. So mm. even by today's standards, that would be allowed. But I can recall yeah. that, and that would, as I say, sixty four, sixty five. Now you mentioned the, some the local bands that you were in. Yes. What other bands were around at that time? Well, in fact, the reason the, the apparently the reason the name the Saracens were chosen was because the Saracens fought the Crusaders, and the Crusaders were tam. 
Tam Payton's band. There was the Crusaders and there was the Golden Crusaders who came from Bathgate. This is what I could imagine. Other than that, the Hipple people, Davey Valentine um, was in that band and he's got a recording studio to this day out by Dalkeith. In fact, a few years ago, he organised... What's the place off Leith Walk? The Miners Club. I can know. Shrub Hill. Oh, yeah. And in fact, on YouTube, if you look up the Shrub Hill Shadows... I'm at the far end, and it was a band put together to play some shadows. It was quite good fun, yeah. and we even got paid for it. Oh. So that was nice fun. So yeah. I am, if you if you know where to look closely on the Shrub Hill Shadows on YouTube. You're there. Do you remember the Embers? Oh, yes. Mm. They kind of came along just after the Saracens and rather stole our thunder from, from what I could remember. In fact, I think a few of them are still around. I know one of them, yeah. I, you do, you I do. worked beside one of them. Yeah. Um, Willie Syme. The bass player? Yes, there was Jimmy Crookshank. But I remember seeing them thinking, this is this is the latest. We've been outgunned <laughs> by this new young band. They were probably a year or so younger than we were. <laughs> so and, there was, obviously there was a bit of rivalry oh, going on. Oh, I would on. say so, yes. Not direct rivalry. No. Well, yeah, well, maybe, I suppose. <laughs> you were more concerned with getting gigs, maybe getting some cash and having fun. Yeah. That was about this. And, so, Copy and doing what they call cover versions of the current current chart. They didn't call it a chart, they called it the hit parade then. Right. So who else was in your ba- in your first band? Who were the members of that? Well, that was a, really a school band, I think. Ricky Ash, who... No, well, that's right, he played with a band called The Avengers. That was another band around at the time. In fact, I'm still quite big pals with Jack, who was the bass, but I was speaking to him the other day. Jack from The, from the Avengers, Ricky Ash. Who else was in the band? There was a guy called John Kimmett played and he had a hit record in America or he was the producer, Randy Van Warmer, Just When I Needed You Most. And I keep in touch with him over YouTube. He came over to visit and I bumped into him two or three years ago. So we've kept in touch. Yes. Other than that... The Saracens, did you have a certain look? Did you decide oh, on the Well, yes, look? it was like the snooker players, white shirts and waistcoats. Right. That was Bobby Smith, Smiggy. He was probably the best known one. He was, oh yes, he was in a band called Blue and they had a hit record in the late 70s. The, the name of the record I can't recall, although I've got it. Um, yeah, Blue. So you went from the Saracens to the next band? To the, well, that was the Moonrakers. And the Moonrakers, was there a change in style for you? Or? Well, they were two or three years or two years or so younger. In right. fact, funnily enough, I can remember there were two tailors. They weren't brothers Gordon the drummer, Graham the guitarist, John Wikes, whose big brother, Harry, I played in his band for a short while. And in fact, maybe five, four or five years ago, in one of these Shrub Hill get-togethers, John and I bumped in. So John sang, I played bass on some kinks thing or something like right. that. So as you said, they they were big into the kinks. Though. Yes, that seemed to be their, their favourite band. Mm. And they were quite popular, as I say, played... I can't remember playing with the Moonrakers anywhere else other than Magoo's. That mm. was that was a big venue. It used to be a cinema, Magoo's, down down the high street. I mm. can't remember who owned it, but it was it would take a... Well, a fair number. It was a funny... It was Well, it was a cinema which had been converted into what you would we would have called then a dance hall. Right. Right, OK. Other than that, can't remember anything else from the Moonrakers. And well, you, you were getting money, obviously. Yes, we were being paid. Yeah. Um, I don't know... Well, I don't know... I, I, I would probably have done it for nothing, but if you're getting money for doing something you like, you're going you're gonna to take it. I reckon over the years, I must have done around about 5,000 gigs, which is a fair amount when you're mostly doing only weekends. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So 5,000, my yeah. <laughs> You get one gig for going out a whole night. It's quite hard work lifting gear from your house into the car, mm. from the car into the gig, setting it up, doing the gig, and then doing the reverse at the other end. Is there gigs that really stick in your mind as being, oh, my God, that was really amazing? Well, yes. When I played with my main band, Allegretto, from 1984 till about 2012, we did most of the... Well, for a spell, we did all the rugby internationals. After When the game finished, they would all go up to the... I can't remember the name of it offhand. Up the bridges. We used to play for them, and wow. they were great fun. There was a spell once where we did five nights on the trot... And I can remember on the last night when we played the second half, I had absolutely no voice. All I had was a whisper. And I was I was more, 
to say it was the main singer was sounds a bit <coughs> wrong, but I did more so- songs than the rest of them. But the rest of them had enough songs to be able to put someone together. But I, I couldn't sing harmony or oh, anything. That just the voice had gone. My keyboard player Pete Pete Clark. Um, he's he's got a great memory for these gigs. I've asked him over the years. I said, remember when so and so happened, and he could give me a good background. At wow. Pete for oh, this, he was a he was a Royal High. History teacher, uh, Pete was so funny and so well organised. It was an absolute joy to work with him. In fact, I'll tell you another true story. I set up in the middle, guitarist on my left and Pete on my right, but he always insisted that I had insisted that he stood within punching distance of me when he got something wrong. He still talks about it, and it's funny to think of because he's a bigger... He could flatten me any time, <laughs> but he reckoned because... I was in the middle that I could punch him if I wanted to. <laughs> Never did, of course. And your your bands was it all covers or were you doing your original? No, stuff? it was all it was covers. We tried to do something that wasn't just straight out the charts. We all tried to do our favourite st- uh, type of music. And I, I mean, I had a really good guitarist whom I still meet. We're hoping maybe to do a little pub threesome instrumental with. Well, we did one just before lockdown. Right. Raymond Raymond Weir. Excellent player, and our drummer was a professional drummer, Mike Travis, and his brother Des. They were really good drummers, so right. it was it was fun to play. And you, and because they they were creative players, when you were playing, you wouldn't do everything exactly the same each time. No. He would he would quite often come up with both of them would come up with something different. So I felt I had to do something too. And sometimes you could try something and make a mistake, and you would think, well, I'm not I'm not going to do that again. But sometimes something would work. And at the end of a song, if you had time, you'd say, what would or to the drummer, guitarist, or keyboard, what did you do at such and such? Or at the end of the gig, you could say, when we were playing such and such a song, you did something. What was it, or what were you? And then and you and you would learn, and, be, and, and we were a really good band. I think. Um, I mean, it's absolutely amazing that you were a support band for some in the early in the yes, 60s. Yes, yep. Some of these huge bands. Well, there was, I'll tell you who else, there was, in, an, in the Saracens, we played out at Bilton Casino and Billy J. Kramer, who was a, he was there one night and there was another night when it was The Bachelors oh. and there was one night we were booked to play two places in one evening, North Berwick with The Bachelors and Kirkcaldy with Little Richard, and I thought, whoa. So we did the Bachelor's gig. We drove over to, to set our gear up, or derigged, got back in the van, drove over to Kirkcaldy, set up there, waiting for Little Richard, and all the Kirkcaldy old Teds were standing waiting on Little Richard. Little Richard couldn't make it, so instead they put on the Bachelors. Oh, I thought there was going to be a riot because the people had paid to see Little Richard. It'd be a disappointment for you. Oh, too. absolutely! I thought I'm going to beat my hero. <laughs> yeah. And well, they were big time in the sixties. Yeah, there were yeah. a lot of big records. They were good at what they did. Unfortunately, I didn't like what they did particularly. <laughs> Having said that, listen to them now. Yeah. They did old-fashioned stuff, and I like that stuff now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but not Little Richard. Richard. <laughs> oh, I'd love to have seen him. Too late. So you, you mentioned that you were nervous the first time, oh. but. Obviously, you rapidly got over that. Oh, and... yeah. Well, I couldn't wait after that. Really? I loved... Oh, yes. If I knew I was playing that night, my day was made. We would rehearse maybe once a week or once every fortnight. And I everybody would come up with... The rule was you tried to come up with at least one new song. And I would come up with six. So if you rehearse six, there was a chance you were going to get to do one or two or maybe even three. In fact, I remember Pete, my keyboard player, he did a survey. He says, you know... Of all the songs that we have in our repertoire, you've got 62% of them. But that was because I was a, I was so keen. So you lived, breathed oh, music. I still do. I mean, I play my guitar at home. Every, I've, I've, got, I've got two bass guitar. I've got a fretless bass and a bass. I was playing bass at that time. Right. But I'm back to playing guitar now. I've got an, a nylon strung electroacoustic, which is interesting because most people don't use them. Yeah. But the one I play sitting beside my computer is a solid copy of a Fender and I can play it three in the morning and I can hear it but my wife can't because you just without any amplification there's enough as it's, it's anything I hear I like and you can get a lot of help from the computer too you can yeah. see things get lyrics chords etc I'll just I mean I guess I'll do it until I die I, 
can't, there's can nothing see. else that's going to take its place, not now. I can see the joy in your face oh, just talking yeah. about it. It's just such fun. Yeah. Challenge and fun. You know, obviously in the 60s, it, it's all analogue, if you like. Oh, yes. Be. Yeah. So did you record back in the 60s at all? Or? Don't think we did. I'd like to have. I'm trying to think. I don't think we did anything. Not with the Moonrakers. You're series. talking about, you know, you're going from North Berwick to Kirkcaldy. Yes. And you t- did you have a van or was it cars? Or? No, no. Well, we had to have a van. Our gear was old-fashioned. Big stuff. I mean, nowadays you can get really good bass gear, relatively small, and it mm. sounds seriously good in those days I used what looked like two refrigerators to play through I did I mean I doubt if I could lift them nowadays but that was to me in those days to get any amount of volume you had to have a big one of them was what's called a Carlson you can look that up if you like it had a peculiar curved front had it built by an old friend a joiner sort of friend built it 60s well I don't know I still felt I was learning all the time then and well I know fine I was but now I reckon I have learned some things. I would think so, yeah. You would like to think so. And who, you mentioned Little Richard Elvis, in the 60s, was there any British Well, the, um, were... I suppose Cliff and the Shadows were the biggest name, and the Shadows were actually a pretty good band, yeah. generally speaking, and Hank Marvin's still going, and he's about 80. I went to see them in Glasgow with my guitarist a couple of years ago. He, ch- he changed. We were two rows from the front. I could almost have reached out, but what I do remember is every three songs or every three instrumentals, he changed his guitar, his technician changed all the strings... Every three songs, wow, um, and had a, a they had a unique sound until the Beatles came along and rather put a whatever put a spoke in the wheels of Cliff and the Shadows. But yeah. Cliff's still going. Yeah, yeah. The as they say, consummate professional. He's yeah. not my favourite now, but they were selling a lot of records in the early sixties until the Beatles, and that was the revolution. I'm not a big Beatles fan. Thank you for listening to our Life Story podcast. Please check out our other podcasts, Leaf Lives, The Thelma Tapes, Analog Rory's Jukebox and Forgotten Songs from the Broom Cupboard. All these can be found on popular podcast platforms such as Apple Podcasts, Spotify and Deezer. Also via our website www.livingmemory.org.uk or we have two Facebook pages. One for the Living Memory Association and the other for Thelma Podcasts. If you have a story or a memory you'd like recorded, please contact us via our website. Once again, thanks.